Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of Martin Center, good morning and welcome to a new episode of our Thinking Talks. The Russian war in Ukraine has shown that aggression and blatant violation of international law is back in Europe, marking a Zeitenwende or a time shift in Europe's security architecture and strategic culture. Unfortunately, this experience, Ambassador, is nothing new for other regions in the world. And East Asia is a good or bad example uh, in this respect, um, having one of the most dangerous hotspots in current geopolitics. And who better can tell us about the situation there and what it means for Europe than the people of the Republic of China, Taiwan. And I'm delighted to having you with me. Uh, as head of the Taiwanese uh, representative office in Brussels, Ambassador Tsai ming in warm welcome here. It's a great pleasure to have you as a guest here for the Thinking Talks. Excellency, you have been appointed to Brussels in 2020, um, but you have been uh, back in, the, in Taiwan for a long time, serving both in academics as well as in politics, for example, as part of the National Security Council. And as you, we can hardly avoid to talk about security policies these days, but I promise that it's not the only topics we're going to discuss because your country is a very interesting country in many aspects. Uh, but of course, we have to start with the imminent threat, the threat by the People's Republic of China to reunify Taiwan with the math, uh, motherland. And well, the shadows you feel every day, might it be the intrusions of fighters and ships into the territory, uh, the diplomatic uh, accuses last time here in Shangri-La, in Singapore, or the cyber attacks, which you occur in every day. And many Western observers, ladies and gentlemen, have linked the current events in Ukraine with the situation in Taiwan. And there's much guessing about, is it a blueprint, what Russia did to the Ukraine for what mainland China might want to do to Taiwan? And we all know that one crucial factor is definitely the support both of Ukraine and Taiwan by democratic countries. And US President Joe Biden has recently stated that the country would defend Taiwan military if needed. So, Ambassador, let's start and let me start with a question. What is the perception in Taiwan about the war in Europe? And what has been the reaction of the Taiwanese people and public on the heroic defense of the Ukrainian people and uh, uh, army against Russian aggression. Yes, um, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. I think um, Russia's invention of Ukraine is a wake-up call to our global community. And uh, it shows that authoritarian countries can just easily make use of military forces to conquer other countries' territory. So uh, in Taiwan, we watch the situation closely and we believe that we democratic partners need to hold a solidarity to support Ukraine and then to raise the cost for Russia's invasion. And like the reason why Taiwan has condemned Russia's invasion diplomatically. And we also join global sanctions against Russia's invasion by, ident by identifying about 57 high technology items that are not allowed to e export from Taiwan to Russia. And the purpose is to raise the price for Russia's invention and to prevent some other authoritarian countries may copy the model of Russia's aggression and to challenge international rule-based order. And also, I mean, uh, in Taiwan, our you know, uh, general public have uh, donated about 30 million US dollars and another 600 tons of medical supplies and also uh, commodities in support of Ukraine. So what I'm telling you is that Taiwan has been showing the unity against the Russia's invention. And the purpose is to uh, preserve our rule based order, not only in the Europe, but also in other parts of the globe. Well, we in Europe had closely observed who will join our efforts, for example, in sanctioning and in repressing Russia. And there had been only a few Asian nations to say the least, who's had been supportive of South Korea, Japan and, and Taiwan, for example. But this is an issue which plays into the bigger geopolitical game which is currently going on. And, well, the United States, I think, uh, despite the aggression in the Ukraine, um, keeps its pivot to Asia, as it has been called under the Obama um, government, that the future of the new, and the new political order globally will be decided probably 
in the Indo-Pacific region. So what does this wider geopolitical framework mean for, for Taiwan, be it in politics or, or as well as in economics, of course? Yes, I think uh, it is indeed that, uh, I mean, the Indo-Pacific region is becoming uh, increasingly important in the areas of security and economy. On the security front, uh, central concerns go to China's behaviors that has become in, um, increasingly provocative and uh, aggressive. So Taiwan has been standing on the free front line to protect our democratic value against the Chinese military expansion. And we understand that it's Taiwan's responsibility to safeguard our sovereignty and security. So that's the reason why in past few years, Taiwan has invested so many resources on our defense sectors, accounting for about 2.2% of our GDP. That includes our annual defense budget and the special defense budget. And the priority of our defense modernization go to um, you know, um, Taiwan's submarine and the missile forces. And the purpose is to uh, promote Taiwan's capacity for doing asymmetric warfare so as to raise the cost for potential invention from the other side of the Taiwan Strait. Yeah. But when we are counting on our capacity to safeguard our territory, uh, we also believe that international community support for Taiwan has become more crucial than ever if we want to deter war from happening in the Taiwan Strait. So we are very delighted to see our democratic partners have voiced their concerns over the maintenance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. So in those joint statements issued by important summit meetings between US, EU, US, Japan, EU, Japan, and even G7 all highlight the importance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. And we really appreciate that kind of very strong uh, message voiced by our like-minded friends around the globe on the maintenance of stability in the Taiwan Strait. And on the economic front, we also realize that um, our democratic partners have paid attention to the significance of reshaping supply chain security on key industry sectors. As everyone knows, that Taiwan um, you know, has very strong capacity in the ICT products and the semiconductors. So we stand ready to be a very reliable partner of our democratic friends around the globe to reshape our supply chain security. So um, Taiwan um, is ready and willing to uh, contribute more to the security and the economic cooperation between our democratic society. I will be back to the economic side of the issue, but let's stay a bit in the geostrategic field. And as you mentioned, you need partners. There are not so many in, in Asia, but Japan definitely, uh, South Korea. Uh, but Europe has to play a major role. And as you know, that in recent months and years, there had been several white papers released on the what we now call Indo-Pacific in, in Germany, in France, Netherlands, the European Union as well has published. And military engagement is one of the dimensions next to, say, cultural and economic challenges. But do you really think that Europe is a relevant security actor in the region? And let's assume there is a military aggression on the Taiwan Strait. Um, what did you think Europe can do in this case? Yes, I think we um, understand that um, EU is not a traditional military organization. EU was born from the idea that economic cooperation can avoid a war. But I'm afraid after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, that kind of idea may need to be reconsidered. So um, what I want to tell you um, is that um, we do believe that um, EU can play a very active role um, in the Pacific security including the situation in the Taiwan Strait, because EU has been a very uh, important normative great power and uh, has very strong experience in extending good values and good principles within our international relations. And we are very delighted to see that um, EU has made very clear that the stability and the peace in the Taiwan Strait can influence EU's security and prosperity. So looking to the future, as I mentioned to you previously, that we will count on ourselves to uh, defend our sovereignty and territory. But uh, we expect our like-minded friends around the globe, including EU and its member states, to pay, play a more active role for the maintenance of peace and the stability in the Indo-Pacific region. For example, what EU may be able to do is to make use of uh, all kinds of policy tools, including diplomacy, economy, or trade, and then to join the collective efforts taken by our democratic friends around the world, and then to um, 
you know, uh, go together to raise the price for those countries that intends to challenge the international rule-based order. Well, the, the key pillar Taiwan is in the architecture of security in the Western Pacific, at least, is absolutely clear from the perspectives of the United States, for example. Um, but it is not only for, for military reasons, and you touched already upon the topic of economic issues, the whole semiconductor industry. And we have seen this during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, how important uh, securing supply chain is, and making economies more resilient. That's a huge work we have to do in, in Europe as well. Um, you mentioned the, the sanctioning of Russia by cutting off the semiconductor industry, but what more should be taken, given that other crises might come along? What is Taiwan internally doing to prepare, be prepared for these things? Uh, where could be oper uh, operations and cooperations with Europe? You know, Europe has released this European Chips Act, and one major issue is that we have to find other partners, diversify our supply chains to be more resilient, and Taiwan will be for the foreseeable future definitely the key actor in this respect. So what have you prepared in the country? What do we expect maybe also from the European Union or the member states in some cases to, to strengthen these ties? Yes, I think um, uh, indeed Taiwan has very strong in uh, semiconductor industry and uh, in past few years when we are suffering the global shortage of semiconductor supplies, Taiwan immediately encouraged our semiconductor company mm -hmm. to enlarge their production capacity for semiconductor. So that's the reason Taiwan's biggest semiconductor company, mm -hmm. TSMC, has decided to invest about 100 billion US dollars in the next three years to enlarge its uh, production capacity so as to ease the global shortage on semiconductor supplies. And we realize that um, you have a very um, ambitious program to double size the production capacity for semiconductor in Europe in the next decade. So um, Taiwan could be a very um, indispensable and reliable partner of EU in this regard. And uh, um, actually, um, in last year, our office in Brussels organized a very important online forum for supply chain cooperation between Taiwan and Europe. We invited more than 600 companies from Taiwan and Europe to talk about how to enhance our supply chain cooperation with each other on those key industry sectors, semiconductor, um, is one of them. And according to the um, suggestion from Taiwanese business circle, um, there might be three things that we can do together with our European counterpart. Number one would be joint investment. Number two would be joint R&D. And number three, go to uh, join recruitment of talents. So to this end, um, Taiwan sent a very important delegation of experts to some of our uh, European countries, including Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Lithuania in this March. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, went there to do the evaluation of those European countries' industrial capacity and uh, their talent pool. And we also go further to work out very uh, you know, um, solid cooperative programs and uh, scholarship mm -hmm. to sponsor those young talents from those uh, European countries to go to Taiwan to study semiconductor technology. And, uh, Recruitment of those programs will take place either um, later this year, before end of this year, or early next year. So I think Taiwan will continue to uh, you know, uh, push forward our endeavors to enhance the partnership and sustainable cooperation between Taiwan and Europe on those key industry sectors that we share common concerns. Ladies and gentlemen, I promise not only to talk about military issues, security issues, economic issues, Taiwan, since the Democratic Revolution in 1987, has undergone a remarkable development in, in politics, society, and in culture. And it has proved that another China, a democratic China, definitely is possible. So maybe you can, to sum up a bit, tell us more about the developments in Taiwan. What are the main relevant issues in domestic Taiwanese politics and society discussed these days? At this point, I mean, uh, in this November, we are going to have our local election. So the focus of Taiwanese um, society go to the evaluation of the personality of our candidates. And then those uh, you know, proposals from different political parties for um, local development. And you know that 
Taiwan is an open society and democratic system. So we believe our system can uh, underpin all kinds of policy debates through the uh, you know, uh, election period. But one thing that is very challenging and very concerned to Taiwan's society would be about China's efforts to make use of disinformation campaign to uh, you know, shaken Taiwanese people's uh, preference and to weaken Taiwanese people's trust to our democratic system. So in past few years, we have been working very hard to uh, move the debates to the parliament because whenever we touch upon this issue, it's always uh, relevant to how to make a balance between the protection of freedom of expression and the speeches and the free, I mean, and the protection of our national security or social stability. And then uh, in past few years, we have uh, reviewed and revised more than 10 regulations and laws so as to build a stronger legal system to take all the problems caused by uh, this formation campaign mm -hmm. conducted by foreign hostile states. And, uh, um, you know, it's not an easy job but we do accumulate a lot of experience in this regard. So on the other hand, we also uh, hope we can share our experience and knowledge with our European friends on how to have a good fight against those disinformation problems exactly, that's caused by Europe. foreign households for our <laughs> countries. It's facing right. very much from, from different sources. Um, you mentioned the elections next year in, uh, in 2024. It's an important year for Europe as well because we in Europe have elections <laughs> mostly at the same time. Um, Maybe you can share some views on, on topics and let aside the, the geopolitics we discussed extensively right now, but what other topics inside the society might be of interest to observe from the European perspective? Yes, I think, uh, as you just mentioned, we are going to have our general election in 2024. And I can um, personally identify a couple of issues that may deserve our further attention. Number one would be, uh, you know, the hybrid warfare operation conducted by the other side of the Taiwan Strait. That may include political infiltration, military intimidation, economic coercion, cyber strike, along with disinformation campaign we just um, have discussion previously. So that would be a very um, you know, hard issue that we we need to uh, be very careful to, to handle. And the second thing would go to our energy uh, transformation because Taiwan has announced to become a nuclear-free country by the year 2025. And we hope by that year, Taiwan um, can use renewable energy to account for about 20% of our general electricity generation. So how to restructure our energy uh, policy will be another very hard issue in Taiwan particularly after Russia's invention of Ukraine, I think our European friends also pay attention to the significance of that kind of important issues. So I just share some of my perspective. Definitely. A lot of topics we could continue. For today, Ambassador Tsai Excellency, I would like to thank you very much for being here with us and presenting many insights in a fascinating country. Let's hope that the opening continues, that exchange and travel will be more easily than it has been over the last two and a half years. The topics, unfortunately, indeed keeps us busy and our center will work definitely on in and I'm very glad to have you here. Ladies and gentlemen, um, our dear viewers, uh, thank you very much for your interest in this today's episode on Think Talks, which is presented by the Wilfred Martin Center for European Studies, the official think tank of the European People's Party here in Brussels. Be back to the next episodes and in the meantime, have a look on our webpage, smartincenter.eu or on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. <laughs>